So I would like to start with a couple of questions. How do you all manage your health? How do you make sure that you are as healthy as you can be? What well, ideally, you'd be looking at all information about your health, and then you act upon them. Which brings us to a second question. How much do you know about your health? How do you measure your health? You probably know your weight and height. You've been to the doctor, got some diagnoses on diseases, got some lab tests from a checkup. You might even be using a Fitbit or Nike Plus to track your exercise, or count calories on a smartphone app. But there's a lot more that you can know. And it's sort of like a pyramid that you see, um, where you're at the top and there's several levels underneath. There's your community, your family and friends that influence what you eat and how much you exercise. There's your health system that provides health care. And you're part of a global community where infectious diseases can spread around the globe and patterns of disease can be very similar across different countries. So I want to take you to the space of the pyramid today and talk to you about how much do we know about global health and how do we measure that. Let's start with a couple of examples. In health, when we try to measure health, we oftentimes measure the opposite. We measure disease or, in this case, death. So you see here on the chart child mortality in the United States. Child mortality is a really good indicator for um, health in a country overall. And in the United States, you see that in, in 1990, the probability of a child dying under the age of five was under 1%. And then we got better from there. If you contrast that with China, they started at a much worse level, over 4%. But look at that development over the last 20 years. They pushed it under, under 2% and now are almost at level with the United States and other Western countries. The shaded area behind the estimate that you see is called an uncertainty bound, and it's a measure for the quality and the reliability of data that we use to actually come up with this estimate. And I'll get back to that a little later. The third example I want to show you is Zimbabwe. And that looks a lot worse. They started off at a worse level than China, and it got worse from there. And then they got a little better over the last five years. So why is that? What are the diseases that are driving these developments? And what about adults? Can we measure health systematically on a global, global level? Let me introduce to you the global burden of disease. The global burden of disease, or GBD, is a concept that allows us to measure the impact of diseases, risk factors, on health of a population. And we can do, look at uh, premature mortality and disability at the same time. There's now a program at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation here at the UW in Seattle, where we're doing this on an ongoing basis for 300 diseases like heart disease, malaria, HIV, and others. We're looking at 67 risk factors like diet, exercise, air pollution. And we're doing that for 187 countries around the world by age and by sex and back to 1990. We're working with a group of collaborators around the world. There are about 600 folks from almost 90 countries. So it's really developing into a global effort to measure burden of disease. So how do we do this? What are the metrics we're using to measure disease burden? Let's look at how health plays out over our lifetime. In an ideal case, we live a long, healthy life, full health, until at one point, we die. <laughs> and if you just count the number of deaths from a given disease, it's a very good first measure to see how this disease impacts a population. However, a death at age five is not the same as a death at age 80. And so if we assume that there's some realistic ideal life expectancy and we count for every death, how many years do we lose between the age of death and that life expectancy, we get a measure called years of life lost. So it's a life equivalent of premature mortality. Now, unfortunately, we don't live our entire life in perfect health. For periods of time or permanently, we're suffering from disabilities. I'm nearsighted, I wear glasses. My health is impacted by less than 1%. If someone suffers from chronic back pain, his or her health may be impacted by more than 30%. And so if someone lives with chronic back pain for three years, we lose one year of healthy life. So now we can express the burden by disability in life years as well. So we have years of life lost to premature mortality, and we have years of life lost to disability. We can combine those two, and we get disability-adjusted life years, or DALIs. And that's the key currency we're using to measure health impact around the world. So what do we need to do to make global burden of disease a success? We need to find as much data as we can to do the analysis. Then we actually need to do the analysis. When we have results, we need to get them to people that can make decisions with the data. And then we want to encourage people to use these data. So let me take you through that process, how that works out. There's going to be some interesting stories. 
let's start with the data. Data about health is collected in very many different places. Governments are collecting data via censuses, surveys, vital registration, disease registries, and other things. There's data on us as individuals in health records, at the clinic, at a primary care physician, and otherwise. There's insurance records that provide information about our health state and information for, for analysis. And then there's every day dozens of articles published on health and global health in peer-reviewed journals. And so we can go through those and extract information from all of these. And even when we have all these sources of information, there are still countries and diseases where we're falling short in terms of data. And so we go to any other source of information. We look at police records and mortuary records and other places. These data, as you can imagine, from 187 countries come in very different shapes, formats, even languages. And sometimes they come in nicely formatted databases. Sometimes they're stuck on paper uh, or in libraries. And we're trying to get all of these. We're very used today to have information at our fingertips. We just Google it. For GBD, we need to find all these data that are sometimes stuck, stuck in hard to access places and bring this all together so we can create information that will be at our fingertips. So once we have compiled all the data, we need to analyze them. This is an overview of the analytic flow, flow of uh, GBD, and I will not take you through all the 100 boxes, but I wanted to make a few key comments. One, the methods we're using for GBD are all peer-reviewed and published in journals, so they're vetted by experts. Um, we're looking at all diseases and all countries the same way. We're using systematic methods, and that ensures that in the end we can compare all these results across countries, across um, time, across um, age groups. We're also looking at all diseases at once, which avoids double counting, especially with regards to causes of death. If you were to compile all the different studies where HIV, malaria, heart disease, stroke is analyzed as a cause of death, and you add them all up, every person would have to die about three times over to make the numbers work. For GBD, we're looking at everything comprehensively, and so every death is accounted for exactly once. And then finally, I was talking about the uncertainty intervals for child mortality. In GBD, every metric we're producing comes with an uncertainty interval to let us gauge how good the data were that we use, how reliable the underlying information is. So now we got the data, we analyzed the data, and now we have results. In the case of GBD, we have about one billion of them. So how do you communicate one billion results to people that might want to use them? We did a lot of things. We created a website, we published papers, we created reports, we did trainings and workshops around the world. But the true game changer were interactive data visualizations that are now available for all of you on the website of IHME. Um, they let you drill down from a very high level into the full degree of detail of those one billion numbers. Everything at your fingertips. So on this chart right now, we would go back to the very basic metric I talked about initially, the number of deaths. In 2010, there were almost 53 million deaths around the world. And you see these broken down by age groups. There's four age groups for children, up to one week, one month, and one year, then one to four years, four groups, and then five-year age groups all the way to 80 plus. You also see them broken down by the different causes of death. So you see 21 colors on the chart, and every disease in the world maps to one of these 21 groups, and so we capture the entire burden here. So what do we see on the chart? We see that there's a lot of deaths amongst children, very unfortunately. Then there's fewer deaths amongst children and young adults. And then most deaths happen at age 80 plus, which is good because that means they lived until age 80 plus. But we're measuring burden not in terms of deaths, but in terms of life years we're losing. So let's look at these deaths when we translate them into years of life lost. And we see that the majority of burden is still amongst children and something we need to do about. You also see among, uh, in the colors that amongst children, the light blue, which is neonatal disorders, and the light yellow, which is, which is infectious diseases, are the predominant driver of burden. And then amongst adults, you see the light turquoise, those are cancers, and the dark turquoise, cardiovascular disease, stroke, heart disease, and others, that are driving most of the burden. If we switch from the life years we're losing to mortality to the life years we're losing to disability, you see very different colors. You now see light green, those are mental disorders, um, schizophrenia, depression, and so on. We see the light purple. Those are musculoskeletal disorders, so the neck pains and back pains that ail many of us. And then in the slightly darker purple is the other non-communicable diseases, so the vision loss, my glasses and me are in there. So when you combine these two metrics, the years we're losing to mortality and to disability, 
we get the DALI, the Disability Adjusted Life Year, and we get a very complex picture um, with burden amongst um, the different age groups. So now that you're all experts on how we measure burden of disease and health around the world, let's go back to the examples I showed initially. So I'm going to switch now to the United States and watch the transition and watch what the, how different the pattern looks in the US compared to the globe. A lot less burden amongst children, increasing burden across the ages, and then most of the burden at the 80 plus age group. It's a very typical picture for an industrialized country. Now let's contrast that with Zimbabwe. Here you see the, the remaining burden amongst children, again in light yellow um, infectious diseases, and you see the terrible impact that HIV AIDS is having in Zimbabwe in 2010. So now that we can look at health patterns around the world and in individual countries, what do we do with this information? Well, first, health systems have to be able to, to deal with the, with the diseases in a given country. In Zimbabwe, the government and really the international community needs to deal with the HIV AIDS epidemic, and we need to address infectious diseases in children. But we can also take a step back and look at underlying factors that either cause those diseases or make them worse. And I told you about the risk factors initially, so let's look at those on a global level. You see now on the screen the top risk factors that are impacting health around the globe in 2010. And we're measuring those by the percentage of burden or of life years lost um, that, they, that they impacted in 2010. So within the bar, they're then broken down by the diseases that they impact. You see in blues, um, non-communicable diseases or chronic diseases. You see in greens, different types of injuries. The bright red is infectious diseases, and the dark red is nutritional disorders. In 2010, the leading risk factor was diet. Diet means eating too much of the wrong things, like salt and processed meat, and too little of the right things, like vegetables, nuts, omega-3s. And we see that um, by the color scheme, uh, those dietary risk factors impacted cancers, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. If we look at the next uh, risk factors, high blood pressure and smoking, those also impact cardiovascular disease in this, in this light blue. So if we want to do something about cardiovascular disease, we need to do something about diet and high blood pressure and smoking. The fifth big, biggest risk factor in 2010 was uh, alcohol. And you see that it impacted both diseases and, as we would have expected, injuries via road traffic injuries and violence. A really interesting story is risk factor at number eight here, childhood undernutrition. Just 20 years ago, childhood undernutrition was the leading risk factor around the world. And within 20 years, we managed to push it down to number eight. We reduced a lot of life years that we lost to, to this risk factor previously. So a lot of progress. But that also means that within 20 years, we switched from undernutrition to diet or eating the wrong things as the leading risk factor, which is quite astounding to me. Now we're back at the base of the pyramid. We're looking at risk factors at the global level. Let's go closer to home. Let's climb up the pyramid. Let's look at the United States. And you see the picture changing. The leading risk factor is still diet. In the US, it's driving 14% of all the life years we're losing to disability or premature mortality. You also see, if you look closely, that the first nine risk factors in the US are all things we can do something about as individuals or as a community. Things like diet, alcohol consumption, tobacco consumption, exercise, and things like that. But then we can look at it in even more detail. So let's look at 15 to 49 year olds, um, young adults, many of you in the audience fall into that group, and you see that here the leading risk factors are alcohol and drug use. And then we just look at women within this age group, and we see that high body mass index or obesity is driving most of the burden or the life years lost here. So there's a lot of information at our fingertips from the global level all the way to, to somewhat granular communities. And all of us can use these, this information. And so can the local healthcare provider down the street, the program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the ministry official in Zimbabwe or in the United States, international organizations. This is, this is information that can be used by all of us to improve health. And many of the organizations I mentioned have engaged with us, uh, with IHME, and asked about the data and, and discussed the implications. Um, so it's a tremendous, tremendous success this way, but we want to take it one step further. So I'm very excited to announce that today we're launching the RU Prize for turning evidence into health impact. The RU Prize will recognize the effort of an individual or organization 
to use burden of disease evidence to drive change in health and to improve health of populations. So as an example, um, if, if an organization were to look at risk factors amongst young women, recognize obesity as the leading risk factor and say, we're going to do something about this. We're going to start a program that helps people make lifestyle changes and we try to reduce obesity. And ideally, we do. That would be a great example for, for a candidate for this prize. The Rue Prize was initiated and is funded by Dave Rue. And Dave is a long-term board member of IHME and an avid advocate for using evidence to improve health. The winner of the prize will be selected by a committee and will receive $100,000, which is fantastic. But it's not just about that. The Rue Prize is about finding examples for turning evidence into health changes, into health improvements. And we want to share these examples and inspire others to do the same and improve health for people around the world and all of us. And that brings us full circle. Managing your health is all about using all the information you can to make smart choices. And so I want to encourage you to keep using the Fitbit. Use the iPhone apps to track calories. Um, go to the doctor and get diagnoses. But also use other information at your fingertips, like global burden of disease, and then use this information to make smart choices about your health and stay healthy. Thank you. <laughs>